Today, my guest is author James Kaplan. We'll be talking about his new biography, Frank, the Voice from Doubleday, a division of Random House. Now, James is a novelist and nonfiction writer whose essays, reviews, and profiles have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and Vanity Fair, among others. He co-authored John McEnroe's number one New York Times bestseller autobiography, You Cannot Be Serious. He also co-authored with Jerry Lewis the best-selling Dean and Me, and he lives in Westchester with his wife and three sons. Well, James, welcome to the show. Jacqueline, I am delighted to be here in Palm Springs. Well, thank you so much. And James, this is quite a book. Uh, It's filled with the best and worst of Frank, much of which has been covered before. But you've said that you show something different about him, hence the title, The Voice. Give an overview of the book and the point that you make. Well, this is, uh, uh, if if I can hearken back to the beginnings of the book, it really all sort of cropped up when I was doing this book with Jerry Lewis. And as we were finishing the book, uh, Jerry Lewis invited me to the 2004 Telethon, which was in Los Angeles that year. Uh, and one night while I was in L.A., I went out to dinner with a bunch of the musicians who were working on the show. Uh, just as a guy, not as a journalist, we went to an Italian restaurant in Santa Monica, and uh, we ate a lot, we drank a lot, we had a great time. And after a while, uh, it turned out that every one of these musicians had at one time or another worked with Frank Sinatra. So I sort of uh, prepared myself to hear the gossip about the women and the fistfights and the mob. Uh, But instead, each and every one of these guys spoke in tones of awe about what a total musical genius Frank Sinatra was. And I was very moved by this and very struck by it, too, because it wasn't always what you heard about Sinatra. Uh, So it was sort of becoming time to do my next book, and I thought, well, there's been an awful lot written about Frank Sinatra, but uh, the, the biographies, as far as I knew, hadn't really managed to get the genius onto the page. And they also hadn't, they had taken a certain uh, outsider stance towards Sinatra. I thought, what if you could get that genius onto the page? What if you could do a book that, uh, that made you feel what it was like to be Sinatra? Okay. Uh, so I'm glad that you told that story because uh, it, it, it did take you, uh, as uh, the material has said, five years and 150 interviews. And that is how the book came to be at a Santa Monica diner in, in 2004. So that's a, that's a fun story. Now, uh, you, the, the main point that stands out in the book for me and uh, what you emphasize, uh, at, the main point among many points, really, but what you emphasize is the fact that uh, Frank wasn't so good with people. So according to what you say, he bullied and abused everyone to get what he wanted. Can you elaborate on that a little? And I'm talking about from his beginning days also. Uh, And then we're going to get into some more specifics. So let's just kind of stick to that point uh, right now, if you would, please. uh, Jacqueline, I would differ with you slightly there. I would say that... uh, that Sinatra, uh, what became apparent to me immediately uh, when I began to do my research, was that he was an enormously complicated man. He was many people. Uh, he was, uh, it's true, that above all, his drive as far as his music and his career and making records were concerned. Uh, this was what was most important to him in life. And, and these, uh, uh, making records, making music, uh, stood in front of everything and everybody, and that included lovers, uh, wives, uh, friends, Anybody who got in the way was sort of pushed aside. On the other hand, on the other hand, he was a man of enormous sensitivity. Of uh, course, he was. But how how did the the his his trying to get his his way? How how did that manifest itself? In what oh, way? Uh, he uh, he was constantly pushing to further his career. He wanted to be... Frank Sinatra was the first American superstar. That word hadn't even been invented, wouldn't be invented for a long time. But Sinatra was a man who succeeded in every medium, every entertainment medium uh, of the time. He was the first one to, the first entertainer to whip up 
uh, hysteria that came about 12 years later with Elvis Presley and then 20 years later with the Beatles. Uh, he, he, he made it happen first, and everything that he did was in the service of uh, getting record dates, getting with the best band possible, and then when he was with the best band possible, Tommy Dorsey, getting out of that contract right. so he could go out right. on his own. Well, now, of course, uh, uh he 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 lived here in the valley. Yes. Frank is Frank is considered one of ours. Yes. So we all love him and admire him. And uh, Mrs. Sinatra is still here, and uh, we love and admire her, her as well. So it's a little hard uh, to ask some of these questions, but it is part of the book. So, uh, but we'll go on from from there. And and you know sometimes too, I think genius is always considered. Uh, uh, bullying and pushing people around, and, and it's not really that at all. So we understand that. But uh, later we're going to talk about how once he got what he wanted, he lost everything. But another thing that I thought was interesting that you that you say in the book is that in order to understand Frank, one must understand his love-hate relationship with his hometown of Hoboken, New Jersey, and his mother, Dolly. Can you just briefly uh, explain that? Yes. Uh, Hoboken, in the days that Frank Sinatra grew up there, was a small town. It was just almost a stone's throw from Manhattan, and yet it was a world away. You had to take the ferry to get over there in those days. And he would, uh, Frank Sinatra as a young man, would gaze across the river at Manhattan and dream about the days when he might be able to conquer uh, the world of New York City. But Hoboken was a small town, blue-collar town, very rough in those days, Italian-American, Irish-American, working class, and below. His mother, Dolly Sinatra, was a tiny woman under five feet tall with enormous drive, volcanic uh, temper. Uh, she was uh, hugely ambitious for her family and uh, wanted to move them up out of the, the Italian-American ghetto that uh, Frank Sinatra was born into. She was, uh, she was a politician. She was a Democratic ward boss. She was also a midwife and abortionist. Uh, she was the powerhouse of the family, and Sinatra uh, said in later years he never knew whether she was going to hug him or hit him. <laughs> oh, dear. That's got to be tough for somebody growing up, but obviously with a mother that strong, that also helped him become what he was. Well, uh, you know, as I mentioned, once he did make it, he lost it all in 1952. Uh, how, how do you explain that that tumble? Can you can you elaborate on that sure. a little? Sure. Uh, listen... Popular music changed after World War II. Frank Sinatra's superstardom arose in the middle of World War II at a time when America wanted to hear the, uh, the sweet and yearning ballads that he was so brilliant at, uh, at conveying. Uh, and, and, but when the soldiers came back from the war, America changed. Uh, it became a much more conservative place, and popular music got... Uh, uh, veered away from those uh, yearning ballads. It became brisker and bouncier and cornier, lots of novelty numbers. And uh, frankly, uh, to, to pun, uh, Sinatra's career began to go downhill because uh, his, his record stopped selling. Mm -hmm. Now, in conjunction with that, there, were, uh, there was a series of uh, uh, self-inflicted damages. Uh, Sinatra created himself. Uh, in 1947, he attended uh, unwisely, it turned out, a mafia summit in Havana, Cuba. It happened that uh, a major columnist from the Hearst newspapers was there and saw Frank Sinatra sitting and, uh, and dining with Lucky Luciano. Uh, this columnist started writing about it in the newspapers, and uh, America got a very rapid education in the existence of the mafia and in who Frank Sinatra's friends were. Uh, then, very shortly after that, Sinatra uh, had uh, the romance of his life with uh, with uh, the magnificent Ava Gardner. Well, could we hold off on that part yes. about Ava? Because sure. we're, we're going to get into that, and I do have a lot of questions uh, about specific aspects of his life. Uh, so let's stick with what you're talking about now, if, if we may, uh, his, his uh, trip to, to Cuba. Uh, because uh, there's many that claim that the Godfather's uh, Johnny Fontaine character was based on Sinatra, even though he denied it, and Sinatra's neighbor was a noted mob bo uh, boss. But uh, you, you find no proof 
correct that Frank did use mob connections to break away from Tommy Dorsey. And, uh, and then you go on to talk about this, uh, this trip to Havana in 1947. Now, you said that he, he was photographed with, with these, these, I guess, what, what, what we call mafia people. Kingpin. But, uh, right, but what was he actually doing there? Why was, why was he in Havana? <laughs> and is that an unanswered question? <laughs> it is not an unanswered question at all. Uh, Sinatra, all his life, idolized these men. He was an Italian-American in an era uh, when Italian-Americans were a minority in America uh, and uh, were much despised, and uh, these uh, mafia guys were men of power. They, in Sinatra's eyes, were men of honor. He idolized them. And so when they decided to use a Frank Sinatra concert in Havana as a cover for ah. for their summit, uh, he very gladly came along. So it was, uh, there was no accident about it, and, uh, and he was there and it was not a good idea and that <clears throat> pardon me that really started his his downfall uh, obviously well now let's go on and talk about his famous involvement with women and we will talk about uh, his relationship with Ava Gardner now he was he was married to Nancy with three kids at the time that they met so uh, what can you tell us about the romance uh, let's let's start with that and uh, and the subsequent breakup, um, I if I will ask you to be brief because there's so so many other things that I want to talk to you about. So why don't you start with that then? How how did they first meet? How did they develop this uh, this romance? Let's talk about that first. Well, they first met on uh, on on the lot of a movie studio in 1941 when Ava Gardner was 19 years old. And mm -hmm. I think that the thunderbolt occurred for both of them, but they didn't really get together until about seven or eight years later. But when they did get together, they really got together. Mm -hmm. they, they were together. Uh, uh, they, uh, each of them, they were very similar people. That's the, that's the first thing about Frank Sinatra and Ava Gardner. Uh, they loved alcohol, they loved sex, they hated sleep, they stayed up all night, they <laughs> swore like sailors, and they pushed each other's buttons in bad ways and in good ways. They had tremendous furniture-smashing fights and then amazing makeup. Uh, so uh, they, they were, I say in the book, they were like an unstable chemical compound that, uh, that couldn't bond. They were never going to be the couple that settled down behind the white picket fence and raised babies. Mm. How did that affect his uh, his public relations, if you will, for a better term? I mean, how did the public feel about that? I mean, uh, that that was pretty unusual at that time. Here he is married to his high school sweetheart and with kids, and he he leaves them for this wonderful, beautiful woman. I suppose a lot of men at the time had <laughs> had dreams about her anyway and probably admired it. But how did the public react to that? The public reacted uh the public reacted vehemently. Uh, this kind of thing happens all the time. It's become cheap in our day and age. You know, celebrities are constantly leaving their spouses or their, or their uh, girlfriends or boyfriends for the next attractive person. In those days, it simply wasn't done. And to leave a wife and three children and to be a Catholic and do this made him an absolute pariah. Also, it was at a time when his career was going downhill, and so everybody in America got to look down their noses at Frank Sinatra, this terrible man who fraternized with mobsters and, uh, and wasn't selling any records, and now he's leaving his wife and children. That, that, that Nobody could think of anything lower than Frank Sinatra in the early 1950s. Now, I forget the time period. Was his mother still living at the time? Oh, yes. His mother lived until 1977. And what was her reaction to this? She loved Ava Gardner. <laughs> Did she? she? She was never, she and his wife, Frank's wife, Nancy, were never fans of each other. They didn't get along. Really? Uh, Dolly and Nancy uh, did not like each other at all. Uh, Dolly and Ava Gardner were like peanut butter and jelly together. They both, Dolly also swore like a sailor, and Dolly uh -huh. thought Ava Gardner was just gorgeous and uh, direct and forthright the same way Dolly was, and, and, and said, to, said to her son, this is a great, and I'll, uh, you, uh, you can supply your own expletive, this is a great expletive deleted girl you found oh. yourself. <laughs> Well, that's quite a description. 
<laughs> now, uh, uh, let's let's also talk a, a little bit about uh, all of the material that you used and so forth to uh, to create this book. And it's 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 a huge book. There's no it's question a fast about read, it. Though, Jacqueline, pardon? It's a fast read. Uh, well, it is a fast read, read absolutely. Yeah. And the fun part of it is too, you can kind of flip back and forth, and and if you want to know, okay, what happened here when he was there, you can go back and back and forth. It's it's really a lot of fun. Uh, however, as I understand it, the children would not speak to you uh, about this book. So is this considered uh, an unauthorized bio then? Well, I think we really only use that term when the subject of the book is alive. Uh, it's authorized, unauthorized, if the subject is alive. When the subject is no longer with us, uh, then uh, those terms don't really apply. I was obliged uh, at the beginning of my research to approach the Sinatra children and ask if they would cooperate. Right. They, uh, through a representative, cordially responded that uh, they felt they had never cooperated with a biographer before, and even though they felt that what I was doing uh, might be different than some of the scandal books that had been written, they didn't want to. They felt that if they if they spoke to me, in effect, they would be authorizing the biography, and they weren't ready to do that. Right, right. I guess that's what I meant when I talked about unauthorized bio. Yeah. I, I have talked to several authors that have been involved with bios, and it seems that term always comes up. It's just an interesting point when... Uh, family and friends will cooperate over certain things and and not others. Yes. Uh, so it's it's just interesting uh, for people to hear. Now um, I have a a review in front of me of the of the book. Chris uh, Foreign of the Milwaukee Journal. Oh, Sentinel. he was tough on me. He was very tough on you. And oh. but the the question that I wanted to ask you was his. Criticism for your reliance, according to him, mm -hmm. on some of your sources, particularly, he says, quote, the big chunk from Kitty Kelly's scathing and factually problematic biography his way. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, I spoke to Kitty Kelly, who, uh, in, the, in the course of doing my research, she was helpful to me. I certainly read her book. Uh, there were parts of it uh, that... that uh, that I did use, but I want to emphasize that every fact, uh, every conversation, every everything I used in my book, I triple checked. This took me five years to do because I did an enormous amount of research, and I wanted to be absolutely sure that if I stated something, uh, that it was triangulated, that I could verify it in several other places. And so, even though I might have. Uh, and I think Mr. Foran uh, exaggerates a bit the extent to which I uh, I quoted Kitty, Kitty Kelly. I certainly did quote her, but uh, but I quoted an awful lot of other people and uh, and and confirmed every fact that I used from Kitty Kelly. Yes, and and certainly there's uh, footnotes uh, in the book, uh, and I personally always appreciate books uh, that are written with notes and sources, so any reader can uh, reference something and go back to the original uh, material and see for themselves. I think and, that was a I wise also, thing to do. If I could quickly add yes, that uh, I, I, never wanted, uh, uh, I never wanted to do a scandal book. I figured that had been done before. Uh, why do that again? And in fact, uh, uh, much of the material that I used from Kitty Kelly had nothing to do. Uh, with, her book wasn't all scandal. Uh, much of the material that I did use from her was not in the service of uh, whipping up scandal or controversy or trying to uh, trying to put down Sinatra. Uh, she was just another source for me. Uh, he spent a lot of time in this article. Uh, it's it's probably a column and a third talking about sources and was also critical of the way you put it together, which is, is being done a lot by uh, biographers, uh, and that is recreating figures. It's kind of, uh, I, I won't use the term fictionalized, but for a better term, we'll say fictionalizing, imagining perhaps uh, what's going on uh, with a particular person in the book. 
uh, and and he he uh, he doesn't like that, and spends a lot of time talking about how problematic it is getting inside his subject, particularly Frank. Uh, now, how about a reaction to that one? Sure, <laughs> I want to I want to separate my reaction though into two pieces. Yes, one do would so. Address the uh, the idea of fictionalization, and I want to address the idea of getting inside uh, my subject's head. As far as fictionalization is concerned, this book is fact. I wanted to write it in a way different from standard biography. I didn't want it to feel like, I didn't want it to feel flat, matter of fact. I didn't want it to feel like a conventional biography. I wanted to give it a force and a narrative drive that was of a piece with the subject himself. I wanted the book to swing a little bit. I think a lot of people who've reacted positively to the book uh, have have really reacted positively to that tone uh, and to to its sheer readability. A lot of people have said it reads like a novel. I take yes, it's a, it's a good read, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but I, I want to emphasize that every uh, every fact in this book, every passage was rigorously checked by me, uh, double-checked, triple-checked, quadruple-checked. This book was vetted by several Sinatra experts. Uh, and so despite the fact that the, uh, the action of the book, of his life, is couched in, uh, in, in dramatic tones and is fun to read, it's all uh, it's all correct. Every quote in there is a, is a uh, is a quote from another source. I what? didn't I didn't make up any dialogue. So there's nothing fictionalized in the book. Uh, the only thing related to fiction is the tone of the book. Yes. As far as getting inside Frank Sinatra's head is concerned, uh, I do that uh, minimally. I try to be very judicious about when. Uh, when I did that. There are certainly many precedents for biographers doing that, not just today. It was done as far uh, as long ago as, as the great Lytton Strachey and his wonderful book, Eminent Victorian. Well, and I think that answers the question, and, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to respond to that yeah. because this was in our local paper and, and people are going to be listening to this show. So I'd like to go on. Sure. I think you answered it very well. Thanks. And uh, let's go on to the uh, next next point. Um, you uh, referred to Frank as the most, quote, uncomfortable man in history and that he was only happy when he was doing right by his music, meaning when he was in good voice. Yes. How did you reach that conclusion? He was, uh, he was very similar in temperament to his mother. Uh, again, that volcanic temper, a uh, hugely impatient man. So many people I talked to, interviewed, who knew him, spoke of his, of his great impatience. Uh, and he was, uh, he was also very uncomfortable about his looks. He was a small man. He was badly scarred at birth. The left side of his face was scarred. His left ear was disfigured uh, in, in, during birth. Uh, he lost his hair at a very young age. He was he he wasn't comfortable in his own skin, and not only that, he was obsessive compulsive. Uh, he was a hand washer, a constant showerer. Uh, he was a man who was so hypersensitive uh, that hypersensitivity really uh, uh, contributed to his art. The vulnerability contributed hugely to his singing and made his voice a voice like no other. But it didn't make it. Uh, his life an easy one for him to live. Now, the book only goes through, I believe, uh, let's see, 1954, is it? March 25th, 1954, 1954. the night he won the Oscar. So uh, I'm assuming that there's going to be a sequel to this book? It will. Be, I, I think that's fair to assume. I also <laughs> think it's it's fair to say, Jacqueline, that it'll be a very different book. This this book is really about the young Sinatra that not many people know about the rise of Frank Sinatra, the young skinny Frank Sinatra with hair, uh, the young uh, the young Sinatra who worked so hard to build up his career. The second book has more to do with Capitol Records and Las Vegas and the mob, uh, the Rat Pack, the Kennedys, Marilyn Monroe, the things we think we know about, but I think there are also uh, a lot of undiscovered truths about those, uh, those areas, too. Well, that's right, and uh, I think people are going to be looking forward to this uh, second book. Um, was he happier later in life? That's that's all yes. I want to know. Is since yes. since he wasn't so happy here? Yes, I think that he was always an uncomfortable man. And I think that uh, I think that 
the same uh, Sinatra that was inside there at the beginning was inside there at the end, but he grew more successful. He grew wealthier. Uh, he found, uh, you know, he's married four times, and I think his last wife, Barbara uh, Mark Sinatra, whom he married in 1976, they were together for uh, for 22 years, and uh, I, I think they had a lot of uh, a lot of happiness together. It was certainly much longer than he was with any other woman in his life. That's right, and uh, certainly people uh, here. Uh, saw them out and about uh, and around town, and uh, she has her own charity work going and is is highly respected, and, and uh, no one, of course, will know but for them, but uh, I'm sure you're absolutely uh, correct in that. It's interesting because we have a local columnist who's been writing a column about uh, stories about Sinatra from local people who have run into them and in, uh, into him in various places, and yeah, so she's giving those, actually. yeah she's giving little synopses uh, about it. So uh, uh, the, many of them are good stories, and then there's some that aren't so good. But mm-hmm. that's what made him so fascinating. Can you go back to the thing about uh, about the scar? Because I, I was looking. I have your book here, and I was kind of searching to see it, but I think there's a photograph in here of him uh, with a, a photo taken on that side of his face, which was most unusual because it's never normally done. Am I right that it was in this book? Yes. Uh, yes. There, there are some. He didn't like to be photographed from the left side. He, in movies and in still photos, he preferred being photographed from his good side, his right, his left ear. You may notice there, I think there was some plastic surgery in later years, but for many years, his left ear uh, had that classic uh, cauliflower look about it. Mm-hmm. It was deformed, and mm-hmm. and that was a matter of great uh, discomfort to him. He, it's interesting because people here who, who saw him would certainly not have even commented about him. Everything about him was frank, so I don't think that was really something that well, the public he had worried a, he about. He had enormous magnetism. You know, you saw those blue eyes, you felt that overpowering charisma. You didn't look at his left ear. Well, that's right. That's right. Now, you do end the book, as, as you said, in 54 with his Best Supporting Actor Award from Here to Eternity. We do know that you're working on a sequel. Uh, is there something that you'd like to wrap up with? I think that uh, I, I think the two big surprises of doing this book for me were that sensitivity I talked about, that vulnerability, and and how and the other surprise was how very very hard his whole life Frank Sinatra worked on his singing. Uh, it comes across at, as effortless, as swinging, as beautiful as this uh, thing of beauty and this uh, wonderful work of art. In fact, he worked uh, he worked in incredibly hard at breath control, at diction, at, at learning the lyrics to songs, at choosing his songs. Uh, the effort doesn't really show. Uh, we are the beneficiaries of his extraordinarily hard work. Well, I was listening to my car radio yesterday and heard him saying One for the Road. And I Uh-oh. have to say, your book has made me listen more to the breath control. And I would say that's probably my favorite, One for the Road. That is an amazing number, and I was very fortunate to be able to interview the great Bill Miller, his pianist for so many years who created that, uh, that beautiful solo piano accompaniment.